Bien, señor Juve. Adam, are you saying a few words at the beginning? Uno, te dan por todos los niños que sea. I think firstly, I may uh, say a few words because now this time, uh, more Tibetans, isn't it? Mm. Perhaps I think our scientific uh, gathering, uh, scientist gathering, maybe I think this is the largest number. Rwatri. If I speak Tibetan, then who will translate? Yes. At the beginning, uh, Most welcome, all participants, and also those observers. Uh, and a special welcome or greetings to our old friends, long-time friends. <laughs> I think at the moment we, as I say, we reach certain sort of level. I think we really uh, achieved some positive result in the field of understanding about external things as well as internal things. So that this achievement, without your participation, participation will not achieve. So I really appreciate all our long-time friends, our scientists, and also those organizers. So, many of you, I think, knew, and particularly those the Tibetans. Uh, so, I may, uh, uh, I may speak in Tibetan. Much easier, isn't it? And also to the Tibetan, I think that's better. Chana da anda, ando chenyo kusinyam doli ya ruru che che, ando kudu che ya che. Ta halam lojuda ni halam chimbere. It's been about um, uh, two decades now since we began this kind of conversations with scientists. Tome Shala, the Pajir Narakirk, the Mixi Tonar Cheche, the Dejik Tone, Gosuri. Initially, these kind of conversations with scientists really began um, mainly on the basis of my, my own personal interest, and that's mm. how the dialogues began. Then, in Bay, in Begi, the Nazo de Kuduce de Adi, Chicken Nangbe. She <laughs> And changing motor chair, I don't go to two in the damage of local cement, lot of the way. So, um, as, as one of the results of these ongoing conversations, which began initially um, out of my own personal interest, was that it became increasingly clear that um, this kind of scientific exposure to the scientific worldview would be very important and also beneficial for my Buddhist colleagues and particularly in the academic centers of Buddhist learning. And because of this, uh, we began the process of uh, trying to introduce uh, formal scientific studies in the monastic uh, colleges, uh, initially targeting selected group of students. 
and it has now been about seven years since that um, that kind of education began. That that shattered the Nalia. That she's a lot of Nalia. Say lots of judge, Dangs on gorgeous Zuku, is that you call a Nimshi Chiaji, Dangs, that she named Gorge Tuing. So, um, of course, the discussions began about how best to uh, introduce formally within the curriculum of the monastic academic centers uh, where they have study programs, uh, the scientific education. And uh, um, so now we have um, established uh, a kind of a, a, um, a systematic kind of uh, protocol to try to explore what would be, what would be an ideal scientific curriculum um, for the monasteries. Uh so, um, and gradually, um, as scientific, formal scientific educations will be established in the monastic curriculum, and then perhaps there will come a time when we will look at the scientists in, the, in a similar manner that the Tibetans used to look at the great Indian masters, the authors of the great classics. There was even an expression and that the Indians, uh, the Indian masters with uh, moustache and beard. So, similarly, uh, maybe there will be a time when we will refer to the and the scientist masters with uh, in a blonde hair. So that the day is on the day that Perkinning was on the Lomir was a Kasha Kasha that young Degiori, that Tani, Ting Day, that Lomir, Garoda Monks Lady Ori, and I'm using Ludu Shangi, Kashaji, that Changa, Pesho Ossi. So, so. Of course, um, over the last uh, few years, uh, during the Mind and Life conferences, we have had representations from among the monastic students at these meetings. But to this time, it's, it's a unique setting where we have a much larger group of uh, the selected students. And also, uh, I have, uh, on our part, invited some uh, young reincarnate lamas who are interested in this kind of uh, dialogue. So they have been especially invited to attend this conference. <laughs> Jidabana Tako Chichinivji Kanda Kazo Tezen Chip Yarja Royalia Ted Mitumbe Cho T. Ta Goyaz Kajamurisha Chazanga Mitumbe and the Tezen Nidus Yavina down to Injigan or challenges that. Do you ever you know? The Yadian Rally attending the Shukche Yadrich. Peru Sajana, Ranzo, Sanje Vichon, Alolia, Chig Surju Lamna, any Tachi Tapshi in Yamni, Munguji, Yondadi, D. Dokchogi, Gagi, Pangje Chone, Ta Banaji, Tomba, Gomba, Sado, Chigita, Nomu Shukchiju. Right, 
ตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาตาต
So even within the the, the Buddhist uh, um, schools themselves, there had been a lot of debates, internal debates. For example, uh, in um, in the aftermath of Nagarjuna's influential writing on a middle way philosophy, um, Buddha Palita uh, interpreted Nagarjuna, to which um, Bhava Viveka wrote a very uh, um, um, you know extensive critique, and and to which uh, Dharma, um, Chantakriti responded, and then again brought much more clarity to our understanding of Nagarjuna's philosophy of emptiness. So this kind of debate has been part of the internal uh, development as well. Mm. <coughs> 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 Uh, similarly, if you look at uh, Chantakirti's um, exposition of the middle way philosophy, there seems to be much more substantive uh, philosophical uh, claims uh, and a lot, lot more clarity in his writing. And uh, one could say that this is a, is a result of the presence of there being a very uh, developed, highly developed, sophisticated, mind-only, idealist school of, of Asanga. Yeah. Mm. yeah, for example, um, uh, Chantakirti lists very unique positions of uh, Prasangika schools, such as the eight difficult points and so on. Mm. So one area of, of Buddhist uh, teaching and, and you know thought and practice that is perhaps uh, exception is is the realm of um, monastic codes, which seem to have remained pretty much unchanged since 2,500 years ago. So, so, so uh, and and the, the monastic codes and the, the monastic um, discipline is pretty much based on what has been laid down during the Buddha's time. And there doesn't seem to be much room for modifications and changes. Mm. And His Holiness was saying earlier that even the text uh, of the monastic discipline begins with a homage to the omniscient mind, <laughs> suggesting that it's only the omniscient who is <laughs> able to fi- figure out all the de- minor <laughs> details of the rules. <laughs> <coughs> So historically speaking, the 20th century has been a, a difficult time for the for Buddhism in general, uh, particularly in in Asia in the 20th century. No, no, I mean, in the 20th century, the challenge about spiritualism. General, General okay. particularly yeah. Buddhism in, in Asia. Asia. Yeah. Uh, 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 Sorry, I, I misunderstood. His Holiness was saying that um, in, in 20th century, um, religions in general, spirituality in general, and, and Buddhism in particular in Asia, has faced, uh, had to face a lot of uh, challenges. And generally there seem to be two kinds of challenges to the spirituality. One is a political nature, but that is uh, something else. Mm. That's not serious. Mm. Uh, <laughs> like in Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, and they completely destroyed Buddha Dharma in Mongolia or part of Soviet Union. But that's political. So as soon as the political situation changes, you see the faith revive very easily, very quickly. Now, like in, in people from China, also similar. 
But that doesn't matter. Uh, now the important is uh, scientific, some scientific concept. So the second source of, you know, second potential source of challenge for um, spirituality and, and Buddhism in particular in Asia is from the scientific side. That the Buddhism when it's shabby, you know, that the Kuduches so uh, from the Buddhist point of view, the mm, fact particularly that particularly Sanskrit tradition, uh, so Nalanda tradition. Uh, so from the Buddhist point of view, and particularly the Nalanda tradition, which is Sanskrit-based, um, the Buddhist intellectual tradition, from from the point of view of this tradition, in fact, one could see this reality as as a, a challenge for an op an opportunity for further exploration. And, and, and discussion. So, Scientific so, um, and, and this opportunity can be, challenges can be seen as an opportunity for gaining new insights, fresh insights. And um, um, we have, you know, brought up this point right from the beginning of our Mind and Life Dialogues, that uh, from the point of view of this particular brand of um, lineage of Buddhist tradition, the Nalanda tradition, uh, since the, the, the fundamental standpoint, the epistemological standpoint of this tradition is to really uh, um, uh, appreciate the need for reason-based understanding and, and evidence and reason-based understanding so that if there are certain facts which as a result of experiment and, and, and um, based upon evidence, if we see clear evidence of their presence, then these are something that the Buddhist will have to accept as part of their reality and if there are certain facts which even may have been part of the Buddhist heritage for a long time and mentioned in the sutras and so on, if uh, as a result of constant investigation and experiment no evidence is found, and furthermore, if contrary evidence are found uh, from the scientific uh, side, then even if these are, uh, has been part of the Buddhist kind of tradition uh, and, and explicitly mentioned in this text, we will have to uh, uh, interpret, reinterpret them. So uh, most of you monks already are familiar that I, as a Buddhist, who is a follower, Buddhist monk, a follower of Buddha Shakyamuni, of course, when it comes to the cosmology based on Mount Meru, I have qualms and I don't accept it. Mm. Uh, external matter is concerned. I think modern scientists, modern science, I think more reliable sort of authority. I feel like that. Now, as far as internal matter, emotion or mind, now that field, perhaps the Buddhist like one of ancient Indian thought. I think long experience and long history. So maybe uh, some potential where, uh, to, contribute. Uh, to contribute understanding about emotion or mind and also how to deal with uh, sophisticated emotions. <laughs> Uh, junior. Ale, 
啊,那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那個那
made part of the common heritage so that uh, at, one, at some point we will be able to see lay geishis, whether or not we use that exactly the same title is another matter, but we, I would like to see, my hope is to see uh, um, lay educated Tibetans who have that level of classical uh, Buddhist no, uh, knowledge. <coughs> then lastly, me personally, when we start this, is this work, my age, I think around 50, 51, 52, like that. Now 72. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps next uh, 10 years, and after 80s, maybe too old. I don't know. So uh, naturally, uh, it is time now to look younger generation. I think uh, our generation, I think we already made some foundation. Now further development, further progress, I think both sides, scientists as well as Buddhist uh, scholars uh, cite also. Now the, those younger generation, uh, like Kamabar Muche and some other so the Kundir Muche like that, now they should carry eventually the main responsibility. Thank you. Now your turn. <laughs> thank you very much, Your Holiness. And uh, thank you so much for hosting us uh, all these years and for being such a wonderful partner uh, in this endeavor. Um, as I look back, um, 20 years ago um, and look around the room now it's been an incredible um, um, progress not only what we see in this room but uh, more importantly I think uh, what has been created outside of this room uh, in uh, regard to the research that uh, the collaborative research that is being pioneered uh, in uh, laboratories of uh, these scientists and other scientists and uh, in the same way that you have invited uh, next generation people here we have a few next generation scientists here uh, that have been um, working with us for uh, a number of years I think you remember Antoine Lutz mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Francisco's laboratory yes. and we've also got uh, Brent Field here from Princeton University mm -hmm. um, uh, right there. Uh, who has been working <laughs> steadily, and we, um, what? Tanya. Oh, and, and Tanya, uh, who, Wolf Singer's uh, daughter, um, who mm -hmm. is working in Zurich. Grand, grand, so, Wolf, Wolf, I know, is it? yeah. It's uh, the daughter of Wolf Singer. So, so, so. Here. Wolf Singer, oh. the, what the, no, German, the German, the German, the German. Yes. And, uh, and your holiness knows that in, 19, uh, or in 2004, we started the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute, 
where we have 150 uh, young scientists and, uh, and also older scientists coming together once a year for a week to explore collaboratively. And it's not just scientists, but with uh, contemplatives and uh, really trying to build these new fields now of uh, contemplative neuroscience contemplative clinical science and contemplative studies. So now we, um, as I was mentioning to your holiness, uh, for the first time in 20 years, we actually have a plan, a 10-year plan, to think about how to develop this uh, in the future. And uh, we very, very much want to incorporate um, uh, the uh, younger generation from the Tibetan side in this, uh, and uh, Your Holiness Karmapa and, and others. Um, and uh, with this, uh, as I was sitting here, I was thinking about how, how we can do that more effectively, and that would be one of the things that we take on. Um, and uh, so as we enter into our third decade of this, um, uh, I look to um, incredible... Uh, uh, um, fruitfulness from uh, the foundation that we have developed and uh, with your holiness's uh, continued support and commitment um, and the com support and commitment from the scientists both older scientists and younger scientists and uh, the contemplatives and monks I think that we will um, be able to have a tremendous impact uh, on the world uh, to um, and, and I reflect on Your Holiness's um, request um, in the year 2000, when Your Holiness asked that, that, that we, we examine these uh, practices that have been developed in the uh, Buddhist and other contemplative fields to determine benefit on brain and behavior and with the, with the, with the purpose of um, finding ways to teach those practices in the secular environment so that more people in the world can use them. And that is our goal, and that is our mission, and that is our, um, our desire. And so uh, it, was, it, it is in that spirit that we open uh, our third decade of work together and welcome uh, you know, everyone here and uh, all of the people who are not in this room and uh, you know, I thank Your Holiness, and I thank the private office, and uh, all of the scientists and the participants here, and all of our sponsors. We have many, many more sponsors than we've ever had before, and without their help, a lot of them here around the room, uh, none of this would be possible as well. And of course, our long-term uh, financial partner, uh, Barry Hershey and his son, the Hershey Family Foundation. So thank everyone. Thank thank you all for being here. And I turn it over now to Richie and to Arthur uh, for the uh, 14th now Mind and Life Dialogue. Thank you, uh, Your Holiness. I would like to begin by first uh, expressing um, my personal gratitude and the gratitude on behalf of all of the participants. Your commitment to these dialogues over the years and your encouragement particularly of the research as we go forward uh, has made a substantial difference to my life uh, and to many other uh, to my life as well as to many other scientists in the West. The impact that this work is having uh, uh, I think now is greater than it's ever been, and we are seeing its effects in institutions of medicine, in the educational institutions, um, uh, and in uh, 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 the funding agencies in the United States, which are now becoming open to this work uh, on the impact of contemplative practice for the first time. And uh, much of the work, much of the work is really stimulated by Your Holiness's encouragement, uh, and so I think it has been very, very crucial. And for that, I'm deeply uh, thankful for your involvement. Uh, I'd like to begin the meeting by just reflecting. I, I am from the Jewish tradition, and we just had Passover. Uh, and we have a Passover Seder. 
And uh, at the Passover Seder, we ask, why is this night different from all other nights of the year? And I'd like to begin by asking, how is this meeting different from all other mind and life meetings that we've had? Uh, and uh, your, the, as you know, Your Holiness, the meeting is based on your book, The Universe in a Single Atom. And in this book, you have, I think, gone further than you have ever gone in public before uh, in both recognizing and appreciating the importance of science, but also challenging us and articulating the Buddhist view of reality uh, in a way which highlights the convergences and also the divergences with modern scientific understanding. Uh, it is our fervent aspiration that at this meeting that you continue to articulate the Buddhist view as well as your own personal views, which I know sometimes differ from the traditional Buddhist views, uh, so that we can further deepen uh, the understanding of the points of convergence and the points of divergence. We believe that this dialogue <coughs> has the potential of being the most significant dialogue that we've had because uh, we feel that since you have articulated the Buddhist view in your book, that we can discuss this in the open uh, really for the first time with the scientists in this way. This, this is something that hasn't happened before uh, in a mind and life dialogue. Uh, and so it is our hope that we can continue to deepen this process over the next several days. The structure of this meeting will be a little different from the structure of other mind and life meetings. There will be more presentations, but much shorter. Uh, and they will be focused on issues that were presented in the book. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're using the universe as a single atom as a springboard, as a... Um, we will also have multiple Buddhist presentations uh, to further the understanding of the scientists of the Buddhist positions uh, on a number of these very critical issues. We have several goals for the meeting. The first goal is to develop a clearer understanding mm. of the points of convergence and mm. divergence. The, the second goal is to identify areas where further research would be very valuable. Mm. And Your Holiness's counsel and uh, um, views of this, I think, will be very influential in how we move forward with, with the research. And the third is that we, we have uh, as a goal the hope that the deepening collective understanding of the nature of reality that it will be uh, brought together from both the scientific and the Buddhist perspectives will ultimately help to relieve suffering as we mm -hmm. understand reality more clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that this understanding will penetrate the scientific traditions, the medical communities, and the educational communities in the West. Mm. So those are uh, um, uh, our, uh, our goals for the meeting. And now Arthur will uh, amplify on them. And then we will summarize some of the key challenges mm. that will mm. be uh, themes for the entire five days uh, after um, Arthur discusses these issues initially. I'd like to also 
express my gratitude. Is it working, do you think? Yeah, it is. All right. Mm -hmm. Express my gratitude and the privilege for once again working with you on these important issues. You spoke about the importance of being challenged. That Buddhism only improved through the challenge which other systems of thought offered to standard Buddhist understanding. We hope on the one hand to challenge you further so that you can improve your understanding of Buddhism as well. But we look forward to you challenging us. Scientists come here also open-minded. You spoke about the openness of Buddhist philosophy to change. And I think I can speak for every one of us if there are good reasons that you can offer for changing our minds based on your own experience, then we are also ready and willing to learn from the Buddhist community as well. We come again not only as individuals, but we come as community. You mentioned that also in your introduction. Your book, for example, I teach out of your book to a group of 40 students, and they gain great benefit by looking at exactly this dialogue between a worldview in Buddhist philosophy and the scientific view. So not only is this of value to your monk scholars, but we have young scholars also in the United States and around the world 18, 20 years old, then they end up in the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute and they can deepen their understanding. So the work we do here is a microcosm, is a small image of something which can be of gre much greater influence and importance. We want to urge you uh, to speak candidly. Is that candidly, clear? Uh, frankly. No. Frankly. No. Mm. Yeah. In the past, sometimes I have noticed out of politeness to the scientists, I had the feeling that you were withholding some of your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. I don't think. <laughs> but we're going but what, to... What thing? I'm going to tell you the truth. No. That? Did you hear something like that? Fresh, you live in the... And the Jesus is going to hold that. So, this was just... He was saying that... Um, he just wanted to warn you that... Uh, some of the ideas that may have been very fresh when writing the book probably now might have been forgotten <laughs> as well. <laughs> the challenges. So that you may find to be something like a new person. <laughs> but once mentioned in the book, but now today. <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, no idea like that. No, no memory okay. now. Yeah, we've built that in. We put it in we put, we'll put in reviews of our scientific work and you will, I'm sure, remember at the hand of our reviews. So we, we urge... While so we are gathering, of course, everybody is have the opportunity right. to, to put questions mm -hmm. or make comment or your own sort of viewpoint. You can easily use it mentioned, you can say. And then the, uh, our program, the afternoon program, from 1 to 3.30. 3.30 uh, uh, The other day I mentioned, uh, Adam, say, in morning time, time is not much precious. doesn't matter. But uh, late evening, uh, then time is very, very precious for me. <laughs> for sleep. <laughs> so therefore, the, uh, of course, the after... Uh, sort of bigger meeting, uh, the bigger no. gathering. Finished, no. And of course, uh, some of you, you see, may feel uh, time for retire, uh, but some younger, hopefully, <laughs> remain another sort of session, session no. after, uh, after after four, um, three. after three thirty, uh, after three thirty. Well, uh, Jenny, that you do, Chanzo de Chanzo Te, any Kudunyam Fogurji, Chasma, Kudu. His Holiness is uh, mentioning to the, the, the monastics who have gathered here that after the formal session ends at 3.30, uh, it would be, you know, he has requested some of the scientists to stay on. Someone, some might you want to retire, but those who stay on, the monks should take the opportunity to be much more candid and free in their questions that they would like to discuss mm. and, and ask. Mm. The, the older ones will stay too. 
<laughs> most welcome, of course, most welcome. Come to Jiggins or Oh, very good. So, again, concerning the format, uh, Richie and I will share the role of moderator. I will moderate the first two days on physics and astrophysics, and Richie will moderate the f last three days, mm. which deal more with biology and the mind sciences, consciousness, neuroscience, and the like. And to begin with, um, we would like to share with you, as Richie said, a certain number of, as it were, key challenges. First, from the standpoint of physics and astrophysics, and then from the area of consciousness research mm. that Richie will be speaking to. So why don't we turn this up? So here we have uh, some of the overarching themes which we'll come back to again and again during the course of our time together. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but nonetheless will give an idea to you and to the other monks as to what we hope to accomplish in part. One of the themes which you may remember was very important to you was the theme of randomness in quantum mechanics, a kind of deep fundamental uh, objective randomness in quantum mechanics and the whole principle of causality, which is so central to your thinking. We'd like to deepen. So, Anton Zeilinger, who brought that forward uh, originally and spoke with you both here and in, uh, you remember, in Innsbruck, mm -hmm. yeah, he will also. T and I together will develop that theme further and see if we can't challenge uh, you again with regards to quantum mechanics and you can challenge us on, I on our ideas. Secondly, one of the things which uh, in some sense we have in common with regards to modern physics and uh, Buddhism, it seems that the, the idea of substantial objects that have an intrinsic identity or existence is challenged, is no longer thought to be a proper way of understanding. Mm. That as one goes mm. to the level of atomic physics or quantum field theory, that the subtlety of our concepts must as it were, become much, much, much more subtle and careful. So how is it that one works with uh, a reality in the absence, no, 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 no. Yeah, in the absence of essences? or mm. yeah. How does one work in the absence of these essences? One strategy which seems to be uh, in the air, which seems to be uh, uh, undertaken now, is what is sometimes called a relational ontology. As opposed to single objects, unique and cut off from the world, we now understand objects as constituted out of their connections, their relationships. <laughs> So in this view, we have on the one hand a kind of emptiness with regards to an ultimate existence, but then an interconnectedness mm -hmm. from which phenomena arise. And so the role of experience, the role of phenomena becomes very important. Next. Now here's a new topic which we'd like to introduce because science has continued and quantum mechanics in particular has continued and since Anton and I have worked with you some years ago, a whole new field has emerged, uh, which is called quantum information, or quantum mechanics, uh, and uh, you could say with cl the difference between classical information, classical meaning, and a new domain of quantum meaning or quantum information. Information say the concept in so can you briefly okay we'll, we're going to describe it in detail um, this afternoon or tomorrow morning yeah, next. Yeah, next. Ah. Uh. it's wrong information Another issue which came up with George Greenstein uh, on astrophysics concerned the beginningless universe of mm. Buddhism versus the Big Bang, where there is a single origin. So we'd like to uh, look again at that theme and ask mm. some, of, some of the deepest questions that arise at the question of the Big Bang 
and the beginningless universe. And then finally, this world of physics and astrophysics provides, you could say, a kind of worldview, a way in which we experience and, and interpret the world. And this has ethical implications. This is something again and again which in your book you draw to our attention, that a worldview has ethical and moral implications. So we'd like to be able to speak together about those as well. So these are some of the overarching themes that the scientists who are concerned with physics and astrophysics will specifically deal with. And in the neurosciences and mind sciences, these are some of the key themes that we will be addressing. Um, first, is consciousness a primary phenomenon that somehow transcends biology? This is a theme that you have come back to many times in the book. And uh, it is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Wolf Singer, who you met in Washington, will be addressing this issue uh, uh, later in the week. Next is, why did subjectivity evolve? And what function does subjectivity serve? And can there be a science of the subjective? No. And here, uh, Your Holiness, you mentioned in your introductory comments the long history, the 2,500-year history of Buddhism in developing a science of the subjective. And uh, the interface of that tradition with modern mind and neurosciences uh, and how it conceptualizes the subjective and why subjectivity evolved in the first place is an issue that um, it, it still remains uh, very key in, in these areas of science, and we will be exploring that. In your book, you challenge us with your uh, thoughts about evolutionary theory and questioning whether evolutionary theory really provides an adequate account of altruism. And uh, this is... Uh, yes. So we will um, address this. Ben Shapiro will be uh, talking about this, and I'll be talking some about this, to explore new ideas about how uh, we can reconcile evolutionary theory and the evolution of altruism. Another key issue that you have raised several times, many times, in the book is about sentience. <laughs> this is a key issue in the life sciences and the neurosciences, and it also has profound ethical implications. Uh, hmm? So this is uh, something we'll be exploring. And Martha Farah, who is new to the dialogue, is a neuroscientist uh, at the University of Pennsylvania who specializes in a new field called neuroethics. And so we will be exploring the ethical implications of this. Another important question which was raised in the book is are there limitations on mental development that are in any way comparable to the limits in the development of other skills? Mm -hmm. Or is mental development unlimited? Mm -hmm. uh, and 
the, the, this, this raises many important issues uh, and is a key challenge for us, mm -hmm. and we will, uh, I think, have a good time exploring that. And finally, uh, on what basis might we hope for an integration of science and spirituality, and in what ways should they remain independent? Hmm. So these are not meant to be an exhaustive list, but these are themes that will, I think, come up repeatedly over the course of our time together over the next week. Uh, and they're all themes that uh, you have been um, so precise and, uh, and sharp in, in challenging the scientific view. Uh, and we have thought a lot about this. We have had several meetings together to prepare for this, and it's been already a very rich dialogue. And so we're um, very eager to jump in and to begin exploring. And uh, we will now start with Evan Thompson, a philosopher uh, who uh, uh, works on the philosophy of mind, who will introduce for us some of the key philosophical issues that will be explored throughout the week. Uh, so I don't think we'll solve them this morning, but we'll at least raise them uh, in Evan's presentation. So with that, I will switch seats with my colleague. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to begin by saying that it's a, a great pleasure and honor to be able to um, present this material to you. And um, I'd like to, to thank you for this opportunity and also to thank Adam and Richie and Arthur. And I would also like to say that as a philosopher, it's a special privilege to be able to present Western philosophical ideas in front of all of the monks and representatives of this great Nalanda tradition of philosophy, which is one of the finest traditions of philosophy in, in world philosophy. So this is a special pleasure for me. I want to <clears throat> begin by giving an outline of how I'm going to structure the things that I want to, to present. I want to, at the beginning, briefly mention a basic convergence in Buddhist and scientific ways of thinking. Then I want to focus on a critical divergence that you mention in your book having to do with the nature of consciousness. Then I want to explore that divergence in some detail, some depth. And towards the end, raise a question about the limits of scientific knowledge, particularly with regard to consciousness. And then I would like to end with some open questions that are really meant to be questions for the entire week. So with regard to the basic convergence, there's two points I'd like to, to emphasize. One has to do with method, that in both science and Buddhism, we see a commitment <clears throat> to the primacy of observation and to critical investigation. And with regard to the view of reality, in both we see a view in which reality, including the mind, is a causal network of interdependent or, or dependently related 
events. Now, given that convergence, the divergence that arises has to do with, as, as you phrase it in your book, the critical issue of the role of consciousness and everything that follows from this, that logically develops and follows from this. And this is what I want to, to focus on. The key questions, as I see them as a, as a philosopher, are, are these three, which again are meant to be questions to come back to throughout the week. First of all, already mentioned by Richie, is consciousness a primary phenomenon that somehow transcends biology? Somehow. Secondly, is our is our scientific view of causality too limited to the physical, excluding consciousness, intention, karma, from the Buddhist point of view? And then thirdly, can there be downward causation from the mental to the physical, also something that you... This is a this is is a is a question that is raised in your in your book, uh, and as I recall, came up in some of your discussions with with mm. neuroscientists. Mm. Okay, so now what I want to do is to explore this. Mm. Mm. To ex. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. So what I'd like to do now is to explore this divergence in a little bit more depth. In both Buddhism and, and mind-brain science, we have an agreement that subjective mental phenomena exist and that first-person experience, say introspection, for example, provides a unique way to access, to, to gain access to mm. these phenomena. So there's an agreement there. No, mm. But the difference arises with regard to the conception of the nature or the underlying nature of these mental phenomena. Yes. From the point of view of mind-brain science, mental phenomena are thought to be biological in nature. Yes. And from, from the point of view of Buddhism, mental phenomena go beyond or, or transcend biology. Now, what I'd like to do is say a little bit about the scientific view that sees mental phenomena in this way. And here, two ideas are important. The first idea we can, we can call biological naturalism. And this idea is that mind and consciousness arise from and are realized in or embodied in the workings of the brain. And then secondly, a much, much more general idea the causal closure of the physical. What this means is that no physical event has a non-physical cause. Or to put it the other way, if a physical event has a cause, then it has a physical cause. The idea here is that take any physical event and ask what is its cause. To answer that question, you need never go outside the system of physical events. So there's a kind of closure a s sort of system closure. Mm -hmm. You need never go outside the physical to explain a physical event. This is a, a, a basic principle of scientific thinking. Physical, 
Sudah kau dah, kau dah nampak saya juga. Jadi tu. Ya. Kalau sen pembul dia ni cuma sedar, tak korang rasa dah ada. Jadi tu. Jadi. Now we could ask, what is what is the status of these two theses, these two principles? Jadi. Yeah. So in your book, you, you suggest there are metaphysical assumptions and that they're a matter of, of philosophical choice. From a scientific point of view, from a scientific point of view, they would also be considered to be working assumptions, and I'll explain in a minute what that means, working assumptions that guide investigation, that guide how we look at things, and for which we have evidence, for which we have inductive or scientific evidence. So let me outline the structure of that thinking here in the case of consciousness. So the working assumption would be that consciousness arises from the workings of the brain and we could look at that from the point of view of evolution, different forms of animal life, and we could look at that from the point of view of individual development, the development of the, of the fetus and infant and child and into an adult. That's the working assumption. Then the, the evidence, this is a very simplified way of presenting the evidence, but <coughs> the scientific belief is that no conscious process seems to occur without the workings of the brain, and affecting the brain affects consciousness. The conclusion, the working conclusion then, for scientists, is that brain processes constitute consciousness. By constitute, I mean they, they make what, make, they are consciousness, or they make consciousness what it is. Now, in your book, you make a number of points that I think challenge this way of thinking. And here I just want to mention them, and again the idea is that we will come back to these throughout the week. One challenge is the idea that there may be limitless potential for transforming consciousness, whereas with regard to the physical body there are certain mm. limits mm. having to do with the structure and workings of the, of the, of the human body. You also raise the, the point that evolution, both in the sense of cosmic evolution and more specifically biological evolution, that that may be influenced by consciousness. It may be influenced by the future existence of sentient beings. There's also the possibility that there may be states of consciousness, at least this is, as I understand from a Buddhist point of view, states of consciousness for which there may be no neural expression or no neural correlate. So that would be... Because So this would be one way in which consciousness transcends biology. And of course closely related to that is the, the Buddhist idea of rebirth and the mental continuum that is not a biological continuum. And then finally, one that I would like to spend a little bit, a few moments just now talking about is the idea of mental downward causation. Huh. Now, <laughs> this is a picture in which I've tried to uh, diagram what I understand from your book to be the Buddhist way of thinking about the mental continuum of events, of mental events, the physical continuum, and the relationship between them. So, as examples of mental events, we could have the intention to lift the foot or raise the foot, hmm. say in walking, and then followed by the awareness of the lifting. So this would belong to the mental continuum. And as you say, the causal relation there is substantive, that is, that the awareness and the intention have the same nature as mental events. Hmm. Hmm. Then 
with regard to the physical continuum, there would be the brain state that is correlated mm -hmm. to the intention and the brain state that is correlated to the action, the, the lifting of the foot. And the relationship between those brain states and the bodily movement would be, again, substantive causation because they have the same nature. But then you say from the Buddhist point of view, the intention to lift the foot acts as a cooperative cause in conditioning the, 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 the physical state of the, or the physical event of the movement of the body. So there's this cooperative conditioning that occurs from the mental to the physical. Mm -hmm. Now, the scientific view, the standard scientific view, would be to say that in principle, the foot rising should be completely explainable as the result of the prior brain state without any reference to the mental yes. intention. Why would we say that? Because, and this is the principle of the causal closure of the physical, because no physical event, for example, a foot rising, has a non-physical cause. So we would appeal to the prior brain state as the physical cause. So then from a scientific point of view, there's a problem with how can we find a place for... So from the, the scientific point of view, the problem that arises is then how can we find a place for downward mental causation? And this is, in a way, it's, it's a dilemma for the, for the scientist. If we say we need to appeal to the mental intention, then we go outside of the closure of the physical, and that's dualism. And scientists are uncomfortable with dualism. On the other hand, if we say we don't need to go outside, we just refer to the brain state, then the intention and the mind in general seems not to be causally relevant. It seems to be uh, epiphenomenal, not to have a causal role. So it's a, it's a dilemma. Um, it seems to be something that is present, at least our experiences of it as present, but it plays no causal role. That's epiphenomenal. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. There's a there's a psychologist. There's a psychologist who's written a book called The Illusion of Conscious Will. The idea is that it's it, it plays no role, even though it feels like it does. So Western philosophers find this dilemma very troubling because on the one hand, there's an illusion, it seems, if we hold to the principle of the causal closure of the physical. On the other hand, if we give up that principle, then it seems we have to embrace dualism, which seems to go against science. Mm 
Žitas. Okay, so that um, covers the, 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 the heart, I think, of, of the divergence about consciousness. And I want to say something now about the question of limits of scientific knowledge with regard to consciousness, and then end with some open questions. From a scientific point of view, even if we assume that consciousness is a brain process, I think scientific and philosophical honesty requires that we admit that we don't understand how consciousness arises from the brain, assuming it does, and how mental causation is possible. So there's a, a, a fundamental problem here. There That's is right. a... Hmm. <laughs> So Western philosophers call this the explanatory gap, that there's a, a gap in mm -hmm. our understanding of yes. the mm -hmm. relation between mind and brain. Now, there's disagreement about what this gap is. Some philosophers say, well, the gap just reflects our limited knowledge of mm -hmm. the brain. If mm -hmm. we knew how the brain worked in much, much more depth mm -hmm. and detail, we could close this gap. Mm -hmm. Other philosophers, though perhaps a smaller number, think that the gap reflects some basic difference in the natures of the mind and brain. Now, I should say that in both of these views, the assumption is that mind and brain are, are definite things that in Buddhist terms have a kind of intrinsic existence or reality. And Good. And I'd like to just very briefly mention a third way that comes from Western philosophy, which says that we really need to change our assumptions and the questions we ask in this context. So instead of asking, what is the nature of things, mind and brain, as they are in themselves, we should rather ask, how do things appear in experience? <laughs> And experience here includes scientific observation, but also first person experience. And furthermore, and this is, I think, the really important point for this way of thinking all scientific observation and measurement presupposes direct experience of how things appear. So for example, if we have the idea that we will go into the brain and investigate it ever more carefully and find consciousness and we go further and further, the fact remains that always there is a brain there showing up as something we can observe and measure because of our experience. Experience must always be in place in order for there to be something like a brain that we can find for analysis. So since experience must always be in place in that way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this means then that experience is irreducible in the sense that you can't ever step outside experience and reduce it to something else. You can't, as it were, look at experience sideways to see how it huh? relates to something outside experience because any view is always within experience. So for this way of thinking, 
we regain the idea that experience is primary, fundamental and, and irreducible. And this way of thinking in Western philosophy comes from the tradition that's called phenomenology. The main originator and exponent of this way of thinking was, was the philosopher Husserl, who was also a mathematician. And as you, I think, know, this idea and way of thinking was very important for Francisco in his attempt to develop what he called a neurophenomenology that would bring this way of thinking into neuroscience and into how it thinks about consciousness and the brain. So I'd like to end then with three open questions, or really sets of open questions. And these are meant to be questions for all of us for the entire week. So the first question is, could Buddhism allow for the possibility that the fundamental nature of mind does not transcend biological nature? Or is this impossible from a, from a Buddhist viewpoint? Hmm. Second question. What is it, how, how much is at stake? Yes, right, exactly. How much is at stake? Second question is, according to Vajrayana Buddhism, as, as I understand it from, from your book, there is no fundamental division between mind and matter, that both are different aspects of a non-dual reality. So one question is, is this view open? <laughs> So one question is, is, is this view open uh, to scientific investigation? And related to this, from the Buddhist point of view, how do these two different aspects of, of mobility or, or dynamism, prana as I understand it, and luminosity and knowing, fundamental mm -hmm. qualities of mind, how, do, how are these related? Is there still something like an explanatory gap between them from the, from the Buddhist point of view? And then finally, how much can we as scientists and Buddhists bracket or, or set aside our own philosophical beliefs and collaborate methodologically? At what point does, does negotiating the philosophical differences become unavoidable, something we have to do? Mm -hmm. And then finally, is, is this alternative approach from Western phenomenology compatible with, with Buddhist thinking on, on all of these issues? Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Do the seat switch. No, stay there. For a moment. Uh, let me just say a word about what's going to happen next. We thought at this point we would have a tea break. Then after the tea break, we'll invite John Dunn to speak a little bit to this, what Evan has done from the standpoint of a Buddhist scholarship. So we have a parody. We have Western science and Western philosophy. Then we'll have a Buddhist philosophical presentation. And we hope also that you will comment and to add your own thoughts. This session, this morning session, is meant as a kind of framing session, a way in which the big issues are, 
are given in a general way. Later on, we'll take these up specifically discipline by discipline. So we'll take a tea break now for about 15 or 20 minutes, I imagine, by the time we serve everybody. <laughs> Thanks very much. Evan. Thank you. It's great. Very, very nice. would like to emphasize during the course of our time together over these days. We have given some framing, some framing questions, said what we think is important, but of course we want to hear from you what you think is important. First we'll hear from, from John, and then we'll turn to you. All right, well, um, am I on? All right. Uh, thanks very much. I, first of all, would uh, like to say that I'm very much honored to be here, and I very much appreciate uh, the invitation, which I received only a little while ago and only knew about 10 days ago that I would actually be saying something. So um, I haven't had a lot of time to think about it, and I hope you don't mind. It's uh, an unusual experience to be talking about Buddhism uh, between his Holiness the Dalai Lama and His Holiness the Karmapa. <laughs> a friend of mine, a theologian friend of mine, said that's like giving lectures on Christianity with Jesus sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little nervous. <laughs> and I also have my first teacher of Buddhism, Bob Thurman, in the back, who always used to scold me for getting things wrong. So I, <laughs> I'm afraid Bob's going to stand up and start scolding me in the middle of it. Which, Probably he should. <laughs> uh, but I just want to make some comments and, and to clarify really what my role here is, is not to teach, uh, obviously is not uh, to explain Buddhism to His Holiness <laughs> or to His Holiness the Karmapa or to any of the monks uh, who are undoubtedly uh, much better trained in Buddhism than I am. But rather I am a kind of conceptual translator, helping a little bit with oral translation but uh, primarily a kind of conceptual translator, which is a role that I fell into when I was working with Richie Davidson in Madison, Wisconsin. So I will uh, be asked to give a presentation tomorrow with Thupten Jimba on, on some issues in Buddhist philosophy, but really it's in a way to try to encourage dialogue and not to present a full explanation. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not the person to do that. I think we have someone much better suited to that sitting next to me here. Um, a couple of notes, though. First, I, I think that as a framing issue, one framing issue, if we step even further back uh, than the steps that Evan took, is to think about what the nature of this kind of dialogue is. And part, I think, of the nature of this dialogue is, is that it's a, it's a difficult dialogue. There are those, perhaps not so much in this room, but outside the room, who will feel very challenged, both within the scientific community and within the Buddhist community. And His Holiness has already mentioned that in the course of the 20th century, there's a sense in which science almost seems to be posing challenges to spirituality in general. And that some of those challenges, I think, create a certain degree of trepidation and fear in various spiritual traditions. So it's important for us to especially take, count, take account of what we sometimes call in the humanities an asymmetry of power. A, or in, we could say a wang cha cha min yamba in Tibetan, an asymmetry of power, where there can be a perception that, this, that science, not necessarily among scientists, but in the, wider, uh, in the wider world, that science somehow holds the power and that religious traditions are slowly being oppressed or challenged by science. And we need to be sensitive, I think, in the course of the dialogue to the way in which that dynamic might manifest itself. On the other hand, it's also very interesting to ask, what is it that science is seeking in the dialogue? What can science get out of, it, out of speaking with Buddhists? Obviously, Buddhists uh, are seeking to understand reality. Scientists are seeking to understand reality. But why? what is it exactly that we are seeking to understand together? In other words, in some ways we might think of that explanatory gap. Somewhere in there is really maybe our meeting ground. And that's where maybe the greatest challenges and also uh, the greatest benefit might come. Uh, along those lines, I'd like to mention just another issue that I think is important that Evan ended on, which is the question of uh, phenomenology. John, just let me ask. Yes. Um, do you need to translate yourself at all for his own? No, I don't. Pejitis. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, I think Jivala will, will <coughs> translate if, if uh, need be. In, in a way, I'm, I'm really not speaking to Ribichi, I'm more speaking to the scientists in the wider audience. Uh, 
the um, the one I think an issue when we speak about phenomenology, uh, really this also raises the question of the objectivism of science and the possibility of truly objective knowledge. Is it possible to know the world in a way that, first of all, thoroughly apprehends the nature of reality, and secondly, does so in a way that is fully objective and is not dependent on an observer, for example, or on subjectivity? There is a tendency, perhaps, in the lay understanding of science to think of science as being fully objective, and that's a type of knowledge that is only third person. But the phenomenological perspective in invites us to consider the way in which even seemingly objective knowledge is also first person. Along these lines within Buddhism, we can think about the nature of judgment, or what we can call perceptual judgment or cheshe in Tibetan. When, one is, when I perceive an object, according to a very standard type version of the epistemology, the image of the object is created in my consciousness. And then on the basis of that image, I have an interpretation of that object. I might see it as red. I might see it as a flower. I might see it simply as a visual object. Which interpretation do I choose? Why do I have one interpretation over another? It's true that this is a reddish pink. It's true that it's a flower. It's true that it's a visual object. But which of these interpretations is the one that's coming to me now and why? One way of thinking about that is the interpretations that I have of my perceptions are based in part on my training. And so if I am a scientist, the way I interpret, interpret data is based on the particular discipline that I've been trained in. We might all see the same data. We might all look at the same image of an, in an fMRI image. But the way we understand that image, if I look at an fMRI image, I just see a bunch of colors. If Richie Davidson looks at an fMRI image, he sees, he has interpretations of what that means that I don't have. When a Buddhist philosopher looks at a flower, if he's highly trained in Buddhist philosophy and is well, has done a lot of meditating, he can see, he can interpret the flower as being impermanent just by virtue of being able to see it. One can determine or know the impermanence of the flower as a correct interpretation of what one is seeing. That's not something that occurs to most of us in an ordinary sense, or most of us ordinary persons. So there's something about the way we are trained which changes the way we interpret the world. It changes the way we interpret the world. There is even an example in Buddhist philosophy of a rather dramatic version of this. It's said that in Buddhist cosmology there are different types of cosmological realms. So uh, we, we speak, for example, of the hungry ghosts, or the pretas in Sanskrit, the yida. yida. Or we speak of uh, uh, celestial beings, tla. Or we can speak of persons. So it's said, for example, that if I see a river flowing by, as I see a river flowing by, if there's a yida who also sees that liquid flowing by, if there's a, a hungry ghost who sees that liquid, what the hungry ghost will see is blood and pus. And if there is a god who sees that, what the god will see will be nectar flowing by. Are all of these correct interpretations? At this level, of, in fact, the claim would be these are different kinds of beings so that actually their perceptions are substantially different. So that even the image created in consciousness is substantially different. And that's a very dramatic case of a major difference. But if we set aside that dramatic case and go back to something like a flower, how does a scientist see a flower? How does a Buddhist philosopher see a flower? Is there a way in which part of this dialogue is trying to understand the differences in the way we see the world and what exactly can be our bridge? At what point can be our bridge? One possibility of a bridge is, of course, experience itself. The fact that whatever scientific data we are observing, we are necessarily observing it. It only becomes part of science if it is interpreted. And one type of scientific datum that we're trying to understand, for example, is consciousness. We all can experience our own experience. We all are aware of our own consciousness. Is it really a matter of how our, inter our interpretive systems are forcing us, in a way, into certain types of interpretations that make the system seem incompatible? Is, there a, is, it, is it possible that we could change our systems enough to no longer have those incompatibilities? And this is at that point, again, of that, the explanatory gap. 
that Reshe Ki Bartong. So that's, I think, the main question I wanted to raise. The final issue I'd just like to say that in terms of, of we've talked about challenges to, to science, and I would humbly uh, suggest, uh, really reiterate some challenges to, to Buddhism that His Holiness has already suggested. And one of these main challenges is actually the ability to take seriously the notion that the understanding of reality is tied to the relief of suffering. And that therefore we must revise our understanding of reality if we are truly interested in relieving suffering. If we, I, I, let me go back to one point here actually. That issue of relieving suffering is another, uh, uh, very closely related to the interpretation of the flower. And I, I should really re reprise that for a second. If I'm looking at a flower and I have various interpretations that come out of it, some of it have to do with my training. And some of them also have to do with my purpose. If I am seeing a fire, for example, and I interpret the fire as light, producing light, one argument, one reason for that might be that I need light. I'm seeking light. If I interpret the fire as being warm, w one reason for that would be that I need warmth. I'm seeking warmth. If we take that notion then, what we're saying is part of our interpretations is the way we're trained. Part of our interpretations, is, uh, part of our interpretations rest on what our purpose or our goal is. Is there something really fundamentally different about the purpose of science and the purpose of Buddhism? such that Buddhist interpretations of reality will always be divergent from scientific interpretations because the Buddhist interpretations of reality in principle are always based on this release of suffering. Whereas what is the purpose of science? Why, is, wh what is, why are we interpreting this data? What are we heading toward? That may be a very key issue that brings ethics out in a, in a, in a critical way. And so finally, uh, then, in terms of challenges, and then finally, challenges to Buddhism. Just to reiterate what His Holiness has already mentioned, uh, that one of the challenges to Buddhism is really the ability to change, to revise the account of the conventional what would be called perhaps the Tanyaki Namshak. There are going to be different levels, different styles of accounting for the conventional according to different levels of Buddhist schools of philosophy. So there are what are called the lower schools and the higher schools. And they will each have a different account of the, con of the conventional that can be used at different times for different purposes. Sometimes, for example, it's easier to understand the nature of perception by using the level of philosophy known as the Dodepa or the Sautrantika. It's much more difficult to use that to understand the nature of perception when one goes up to a higher school, such as the mind-only school. And so we, when we're trying to teach others the nature of perception, we generally stay at the, at the level of, at least in the beginning, at the level of this lower school. Might a scientific, a, a sort of Buddhist appropriation of science into a new version of the conventional be possible that would fit somewhere in that hierarchy? It might not be at the top but some kind of a new version of the conventional that is based on science. And especially, and here's a question that I'm intrigued by, could we come up with a version of the conventional based upon the Vajrayana, which I don't think has ever been done at this point, based on this notion of Lungsami... Uh, yeah. And could we give an account of perception and uh, in other words, give a full account of Lodrik from the point of view of the Vajrayana. I don't know if this is possible, whether it's necessary, but it would be one way of closing that explanatory gap as well. I think this is perhaps the major challenge in some ways to Buddhism, how to bring scientific education into Buddhist institutions, how to take seriously the, uh, the need to revise traditional learning. Uh, it's not an easy task, I don't think, but it is perhaps the major challenge. So that's all I have to offer. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Maybe I can just point to two of the things which you said, which I hope we will be able to carry forward. One I interpreted as 
can we change our working assumptions to move beyond, for example, this objectivism that we have in the sciences? For example, by giving more standing to experience, which is a place where both traditions might find common ground. Is it possible to actually develop a philosophy of, shall we say, experience from the standpoint of physics and cosmology and neuroscience and so forth? on the one side, and also from the other side, the Buddhist side. And I take that to be connected to this final comment of yours concerning the Vajrayana, that is it possible to come up with an account of conventional reality from that vantage point also. And I think while there have been beginnings, it sounds like in both traditions, there hasn't been a full elaboration of such a possibility. And it's an interesting and perhaps very important point to raise at this, at this beginning. This might be a kind of common task. Now, Your Holiness, we were hoping that you would also be able to help us frame this week's discussions by you know, pointing out things which you feel are specifically important out of the Mind and Life Dialogues, out of writing your book. What were some of the residual questions, urgent issues that you would still like to work through more fully together with the scientists and Buddhists who are here? Oh, I don't know. As, we, as, as the discussion uh, um, progresses, his Holiness was saying, hopefully, you know, it will trigger trigger thoughts. Mm. Uh, as you, uh, uh, I think you touched. Mm. Uh, uh, since some time back. Uh, I uh, say uh, I'm telling people uh, that uh, we should, because we should not use some kind of the dialogue between Buddhism and science. Then that means Buddhism as a whole also include about you see different paths, also next life or these things. And also about Buddhahood, uh, about Buddha's mind, about Buddha's body. <laughs> that is we are not discussing. <laughs> so, the, uh, the, uh, firstly, we should, because of the, uh, what is the, name? the divide in Buddhist, the, in Buddhism, the first part. No, no, no. Nature of reality. Oh. Yeah. So that might be considered as a Buddhist science. What is reality? Then, on the basis of that reality, then Buddhist concept or Buddhist philosophy come. So that's second part. Then third, Buddhist practice. Uh, meditation on these things. So, uh, where the scientist and Kazore, Buddhist discussing is the this first part, first part, reality. We are not discussing even these two things. Mm. This is our private business. <laughs> 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 so, in any way, you see, that is the uh, beyond our ordinary sort of uh, perception, right? No, no. For example, there are domains of the Buddhist uh, thought mm. which includes, for example, the various levels of realization, uh. advanced levels of realization, normally referred to as the ground levels uh. and, and, the, and the paths. So some of our uh, 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 experience meditation. Uh, uh, some people may have uh, some experience. As far as m uh, my concern, it's not such experience. <laughs> so this is uh, something like is it talking something is it beyond there. Yeah. So that's that was meaning. So the first part, Buddhist science. Now here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, external things, internal things. So since I think external things is concerned, 
I think modern scientific research now, I think a few centuries now, concentrate on it with big missions. So see, your knowledge is much advanced. Therefore, it is very, very useful to learn uh, from modern science. Then the internal thing, mental thing. Now, because see, Buddhism, the main purpose now you mentioned, you see, main purpose is not just mere knowledge, but you see the uh, main concern is how to achieve peace of mind or happier life, and how to challenge when we face some problems. That's the main purpose. So the challenge, not earthquake, not sort of kasa, uh, tsunami, 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 but internally. So therefore, the disturbances or the troublemaker is part of our own mind. And the, so the answer or counter force must come within mind. So therefore, mind becomes something very important sort of subject. Right? Right. So a lot of exploration, uh, exploration, right? exploration, explorations or explanation and very detailed terms of these different minds. Uh, so therefore, uh, when the, when Buddhists you see, they try to explore the reality, more emphasis on the mind or emotion, because main purpose is how to turn our mind and become more stable, more peaceful. Uh, uh, ชุบลุยดาชุบลุยดาหนาวอย่างเสียดิชุดท้องเสียหลอดเพียงจะทุ่งกี่ยังไม่มีมิชินได้ชุดท้องเสียหลอดดิยิ่งหนาวทุ่
Takarde. Banzayana. The highest form of Banzayana's explanation could be considered most reliable or subtle. So therefore, I think here, certainly, uh, it's useful. And particularly, the field that there that the sugestion that some in Namshi in between Jerak or Shayin do now the Jana Yakshurisha. So particularly uh, on the on the difficult subject of um, how does the mind and matter come to you know interface? Mm -hmm. This this explanatory gap here. His Holiness was saying that he feels Vajrayana perspective may perhaps be the most appropriate one to explore. That is, sugestion Tara Mugusha Guruya, Shiva Tara Mugya but Namshi. So the, the, the one issue here is that just as in the in the in the Buddhist thought, um, uh, different levels of subtlety of consciousness or, or the mental phenomena is uh, recognized. Similarly, when we are talking about the prana, which is this the, the mobility aspect, the roughly translated as wind or and this energy, um, just as there are many different levels of subtleties of consciousness, similarly there are correspondingly different levels of subtleties of this energy. Jazaka, broadly speaking, Shiva's yin shi jala sugzhen jala ten gubere is in the page of Tore. Dear love, the channel scientist to talk to you. So uh, his Holiness was saying that, you know, um, broadly speaking, uh, from the Vajrayana perspective, one could say that so long as it's, it's a mental uh, phenomena or mental event or, or, or con uh, a conscious event, then uh, it will uh, it is necessarily contingent upon um, a, a physical uh, event or physical phenomena. So, uh, in general, one can make that broad statement. So, which probably will give greater comfort to the scientist. That the issue with the however. But then this statement will immediately have to be followed with the however clause. That. <laughs> So, so the caveat that however that needs to be immediately followed with a statement um, is that um, uh, the, 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 the physical basis, this energy that we are talking about, the prana, is, is, is a very subtle kind that, that really isn't the, the, the there, there concept are, of... And prana, there are various levels of prana, including our breathing, or some uh, energy which carry all the movement, even if the brain cells movement, this is very much related with that energy. Energy works with the movement. So including mental sort of movement also is due to that energy. So energy itself, or prana itself, you see, there are many levels, different levels. of differences, different, different levels. So you have to explore through scientific way. So His Holiness was uh, wondering whether the, the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the scientific um, kind of mm. um, concept of matter, what is physical, probably needs to be modified to really appreciate the, this, this, this subtle energy. But his Holiness is uh, just reminding um, on the part of the Buddhists, especially those who are uh, educated in the monastic academic centers, um, um, we, we learn certain taxonomies of reality at a very early age um, before we fully know what they mean. And, and in, within this taxonomy of reality, we talk about there being permanent phenomena and impermanent phenomena. And within impermanent phenomena, we speak of three main categories of phenomena, the ma material phenomena, mental, 
and then the abstract ideas or abstract entities. So because we learn this taxonomy from such an early age, we somehow tend to assume when we think of matter and mind as these two independent discrete realities out there with their own kind of independent existence. So this is something that we need to watch out for. That we, and, and even in the case of, um, uh, for example, you know, if you look at any, uh, from, if you take the Vajrayana perspective, then any mental event is going to have a, uh, physical, this in this Vajrayana sense and uh, dimension. So uh, and and also in our day-to-day -day life experience, for example, there are subtle states of consciousness, like more subtle states of consciousness, like in the dream state, and uh, many of which it is obvious that or deep sleep, deep sleep, mm. all of these uh, um, mental states are contingent upon uh, the brain. Chazanga. <laughs> So on the part of the Buddhists, um, because when scient scientists talk about kind of biological uh, uh, understanding of the, the nature of consciousness, as you know, uh, consciousness as being kind of you know uh, arising from biological phenomenon and consciousness uh, processes of consciousness being processes of the brain. Uh, from the Buddhist point of view, the discussion is still at the level of what the Buddhists would refer to as the gross levels of mind. So, in that respect, you know, His Holiness is telling the Buddhist colleagues that we don't need to be <laughs> alarmed when we hear this kind of statement. Mm. Uh, Cargo. Then a chevalier tara change the name. Dog when you ring shing in the good chick. That dog when you go chick. Then a nave nigger chick. That nave nigger dog slow in the name. The ring shing you talk about Tim's chair. The other one said the ring shing you talk about Sunjit with that. So that did the pageant biological joy to pageant. That so from the so uh, now if you, if you relate this discussion to the Vajrayana perspective then, um, and within the Vajrayana language, um, there, there is a, um, a recognition of the different levels. No. So in, in this Vajrayana um, kind of, you know, um, map of conscious, consciousness, um, there is a recognition of different levels of subtlety and also quite different phases or stages. For example, one stage of the, the consciousness is referred to as the stage of conception, but conception is in a, in a different sense. And uh, so the uh, thought... Uh, so we're not really talking about yeah. it. Yeah. Mm. So it's kind of a thought level, but again here it's, it's, the, the term is tricky. But the point is um, Vajrayana makes distinctions between key phases of uh, our con uh, experience of consciousness. One is the phase of thought, this is Tokpa, uh, and then the one is phase of Nangwa as an appearance. And uh, so all the gross levels of um, mental experience that we have are within this field of tokpa, the, the thought. And that goes all the way up to uh, you know, final stages of our dying processes. And then once you... So for example, there is a discussion of the dissolution of 80 uh, different, cat different types of conceptions that are indicative of certain mental processes. So it's only, you know, so up to that point, uh, even these, um, so, at, you know, w when these dissolve, uh, the respiration ceases. 
So until that I point, I think most probably brain function ceases. So uh, after that, only after that, no, no should you understand. So after that point, all the up to that point, all the levels of you know consciousnesses, you know all the processes and mental pro processes, they are contingent upon the brain as the basis. But once that eighty conceptions indicative of, uh, of of mental processes cease, then the appearance level begins. Then it is beyond it transcends you know brain brain state and biology. But this is of course the then raises the question of how can we investigate this? And uh, here one possible avenue was to experiment on um, the people who are, you know, the meditators who are in what the tradition calls in the clear light state. And the problem we after had, death. after that, the, the problem we had was, um, you know, when we had the machine, nobody and was... Sometime back, I think, I think it was 10 years ago, I think, some simple machine, supposed to test, so leave it at, I think, Delhi Hospital. So while that machine there, nobody died <laughs> <laughs> with that experience. <laughs> so uh, when, uh, afterward, you see, someone, you see, remain in the, in the dead mental state. Uh, I think uh, one week, or some cases, two, three two weeks. weeks yeah. mm. So then no longer that mission available. <laughs> <laughs> is it so, only at, at death that clear light state emerges, or is it also possible in deep meditation states? Uh, deep meditation Actually, now, I think more than 30, 30 years ago, I think 30, 40 years ago, uh, okay, uh, some occasion, I appealed to the public. No. Our explanation about Buddha Dharma, including Tantiana, is something like kasa, uh, currency. Pa paper money. Paper money. Mm. Now, whether that paper money remains valuable or not, you, see, you need other like reserve, reserve, gold reserve or these things. Mm. So now here, the, uh, like the gold reserve, is now someone must practice through implement uh, through, uh, through practice must produce these different experiences. That's the real uh, the, the no, the result the also, oh. yeah. So that that would support mm. the value of the currency. Uh, so since then, you see, we encouraged some people to remain in these mountains, and also I uh, touched some. Uh, uh, and also Kamsan, uh, like that. So some, eventually, some quite uh, extraordinary experience, you see, happen. Uh, so that is something like our own laboratory. Right? Laboratory. Mm -hmm. Laboratory. Uh, See, uh, must produce through meditation. Now, in order to do that, at least you see, your single-pointed mental so power should remain single-pointedness, right. single-pointedly, shamatha, four hours. Uh, through that way, the single-pointed mind, not meditated on external things, but certain channels or certain area within the body, then the energy eventually move. So the actual effect on this body then take place. So if we have that kind of a person who already experienced, then we can challenge very easily to you. <laughs> 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 that, that's not a challenge. Then, of course, that really gives you 
So, mm. New understanding. Yeah. Ah, new phenomena, isn't it? New phenomena, new phenomena. Ah, no problem. So, ah, um, we're both, you see, trying to see the reality. So to answer to um, Arthur, your question, His Holiness was saying that um, um, even those individuals who remain in a clear light state at death, that need not necessarily imply that while they were alive, they had this advanced experience themselves. But Someone they might have? They might have. They might, they might have, have already beforehand. Yeah. 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 Sure. Richie, did you want to? Yes. Uh, we, one of the things we, we have done this, this visit oh. to Dharamsala is we have brought with us a very, very sensitive thermal camera that can actually monitor the body temperature from a distance. Oh. And uh, it is our hope to uh, do exactly what you are encouraging. Uh, we will leave this here mm. in Dharamsala once we leave and we'll train people oh, here. Good. Mm. Uh, and so uh, uh, we have very much taken your challenge seriously and this is, we think, the best available state-of-the-art methodology to begin to examine this in a very rigorous scientific way. Very good. Uh, one time I also mentioned to Mushi, Kamu uh, Mushi, this point should keep in your mind. I think sometime back, I think at least, uh, I think two, three years ago. Uh, so whenever you see someone, you see who uh, usually uses some exp some practice, then such person you see uh, death occurred, then let us know. Very important. Very important. The best thing, some people are saying, "Man, do you think that he is actually doing that? Much more than that. This is how they are going to do it. Some people think that he is actually doing that. Should you just walk or something? No, that's not true. Must be a word. The best candidate would ideally be someone who is able to invoke that kind of experience while they are alive, rather than having to wait until it's the death mm. time. Uh, after death, it's still mystery. Isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Someone who really experienced that level of mind, mm -hmm. uh, all the dissolution completely. Did you so the same uh, phenomena uh, exactly like death. So uh, we were trying to clarify, folks. Imagine there's a yogi who's able to a yogi who's able to invoke this experience uh, as a result of a training. Uh, we were clarifying whether they will we will observe all the physical signs like a cessation of the breathing process and. You know, sensation of the brain So that according to the, the understanding is that if a yogi is deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now he truly <laughs> acts like scientist. <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> he spends too much time with us. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> so your influence more influence more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just, uh, you know, I was, you know, I was just trying to give us uh, a straight version. <laughs> no, no, I, I was trying to clarify what was His Holiness's own personal view because I said yes, the text does say this, but <laughs> so that's what I said. The text does say this, but what was your, <laughs> what is your position. Um, so in, to, to clarify, um, the, the, a yogi who is able to deliberately, you know, willfully invoke this experience as a result of, you know, and, and there are certain uh, kind of prereq prerequisites uh, mentioned by His Holiness, one of which is the attainment of shamatha, with the ability to remain one's attention focused on a chosen object for a period of four hours at a time. So on that basis, uh, the yogi is able without to... Without slight, without slight distance at all. Because of that. Wavering, distraction, uh, yeah. Uh, mm. And fully alert. Not just a singing. Full alert. Mm. 
then if he's able to, he or she is able to bring that experience of clear light, of, of dissolution. No, 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 So the a yogi who is able to, on the basis of shamatha, then of course through a long process of practices, is able to deliberately invoke the dissolution processes and reach a point beyond these 80 conceptions indicative of the mental processes and reach at this stage of nawa, the appearance. At that point, we'll have the same physical expressions. The breathing, respiration ceases. There should be, uh, the, the brain level of activity should also cease. Exactly like uh, experience at the time of death. Then reap process. Right. Uh. So on that way, you can kazoda transmit way right. your yourself to other body. <laughs> so I believe, of course, uh, I believe uh, those you see, pe- people, those uh, great sort of practitioner in the past. Uh, I don't think all of them liar. Mm-hmm. I don't think. Mm. Some may be liar, <laughs> huh? <laughs> but not all. Mm. So therefore, there must be some basis. Some basis no. mm. So therefore, in my, my myself, you see, in the age around the 30s, I also you see uh, very much so keen is to practice that. Then, of course, time not permits. Now too late. Now I, pref- I prefer, you see, death as an ordinary person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we'd agree that you're an ordinary person. Oh. I don't think you're an ordinary person. <laughs> so that's from the, uh, from the other. As a practi- practitioner's viewpoint, no, there's a failure, no, of course. Of course, I can easily excuse because Dalai Lama is always busy, busy, busy. No time. <laughs> <laughs> That's good excuse. It's an excuse we all use, I think. Uh, but, but some of these monks, uh, difficult excuse. to excuse like that. Yeah? <laughs> 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 so some of these monks, I think, should, at least some of them should Kazuta, put practice no, really. and make effort. So I learned to ask you, by the time go, I don't know. And Gave it to the Yamanjas at the Lam de Cross of Choins. Shambekumne, Zoluntilin Yamne, Pumbu Makukune, Zoluntilin Yamne Chekwa Sundua. So, covering the day, eh, Casuli, Tisho Rugula, some time in there. His Holiness was um, <coughs> um, sharing with the monks that sometimes he feels that um, uh, with so much emphasis placed on the common. Uh, foundational practices in, in, in the Buddhist part, such as bodhicitta and um, emptiness, understanding of emptiness and so on. Perhaps sometimes we neglect the importance of, uh, you know, right from the beginning, taking Vajrayana practices seriously. Um, because the Vajrayana practices, especially the ones that deal with prana, uh, are, are such that they need to be embraced very early on in, when you are young. In fact, Kirur Rinpoche says in one of his writings that those who have the attitude that when I'm young, I will study, and when I'm older, I will practice, this kind of thinking is totally counterproductive uh, uh, is, uh, to the Vajrayana practice, because the Vajrayana practice requires kind of, you know, utilization of um, you know, bodily energy, which needs to be done when the body is in its prime, um, not when it is um, you know, kind of going down. There are important implications for our education initiative in terms of what practices may be best uh, taught at particular ages. Pajiri. No, it's true. Mm? true. 
Sometimes they uh, take it as a kind of a license to do all sorts of silly things. But that's, uh, of course, a that's misunder- not case. misunderstanding of Vajrayana. Right, hmm. So, that time? Lunch? Time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Holiness. I think we are still filled with questions, and we look forward to the next uh, stage when we'll be working with Anton Zeilinger and quantum mechanics. Oh. So, we'll come back here at one o'clock. We'll be here promptly at one. What we'd like to suggest is that the those, those of us who are participants are going to have to leave immediately, so we'll allow His Holiness to depart, the Karmapa to depart, and then we will excuse ourselves. We'd ask that the audience basically stay put until we get out, because we have a meeting that we have to attend together and plan the afternoon. So please excuse us for not socializing with you in these, in these minutes after the break. Thank you. Thank you both.